Well, thank you for coming. I'm Verl Farnsworth, Chairman of Constitution in the Classroom. And uh, Adrian Weiss will share today's uh, lesson and instruction with me. Uh, last week, each of you got an introduction to free enterprise and free markets. And one of the reasons that we start with that as our lesson is that under the banner of freedom itself, free markets and free enterprise affects everybody. On, and it should. Now, there's a principle involved in free markets and free enterprise that some do not even recognize, and that is that within that system, there are a number of checks and balances. So I'll ask you a question. Within free markets and free enterprises, what would be a check and balance? We have that. We hear it all the time in the way our government is organized with the three branches and distribution of rights and powers. But how does it pertain to free markets and free enterprise? What's a check and balance? Competition. Okay, competition. Okay, what's another check? Have you ever heard if you don't work, you don't? Feast. You don't feast or eat. Well, see, that's a natural process. And it's all a piece of freedom itself. And so... When, when we understand how this Constitution and its, the, uh, the powers that it protects and the rights that it protects, then we can better understand why free markets and free enterprise is part of the system because it has its own checks and balances for individuals to work with and work under to be held accountable for themselves. And so it fits. It's not what others who want to tear down the free market system have in mind. Uh, it's not a system of handouts. And it never was. You'd never have freedom. You wouldn't have this Constitution. And you wouldn't have the protections that you have today if everything was a handout. Because ask yourself the question, how, much of all, how many of these rights did King George actually hand out to the patriots? Zero. Zero. None. So when you understand the process, truth follows a pattern. In all areas, you, you, can, you will not be deceived if you understand the pattern that Truth follows, okay? That's important. Well, what you learned is that there's been this almost 6,000-year history of where nothing progressed until in the American system we ended up with freedom. And individuals had the right to own their own time and their own labor. And that, of course, brought about this marvelous revolution that we as some refer to as the Industrial Revolution, and now we've had, they've subtitled three more of them since then. But all of that is a part of the process of freedom all by itself. But what was significant is when you analyze it is that all of that is within a 200-year period. The whole nucleus of that process is contained within a 200-year spot of time in the history of mankind. And if you wanted to be a paleontologist and you want to study history and age by the age of the rocks, we even do better, don't we? 200 years in the 50 million plus that they say the earth has been here or man has existed. And we take this amount of uh, exalted advancement in a 200 year period. It's even better than you take it from the creation story. Okay. With a 6,000 year time frame. So the significance of this industrial enlightenment is very significant to its very happening in the history of America and in the world itself. This is important. We have to get ourselves into a, a frame of mind to think like they were thinking and why they were thinking the way they were thinking. Well, there was, how did they come up with the principles of freedom that they arrived at what was their thinking that drove that to get to those conclusions? What were the guidelines in their lives that kept them from going off, which we're going to study later here, in the tyrannical or just anarchical mind? Okay. There is a success formula, and we're going to discover that completely today in the fact that the rule of law, as it has become known here in America, replaced ruler's law, which has ruled the earth from the beginning of time. In every society, ruler's law has prevailed. 
But the rule of law now, you're going to learn before you walk away today how to recognize immediately which of these two systems that you're living under. Alexander Teitler, and, and this diagram is in your workbook, and for me, that workbook is for you. I'm not going to teach you from the workbook today. You use that as a review. If you want to fill it out as we go and you catch parts, that's great. Alexander Teitler was a contemporary of the Founding Fathers. He lived in the very same time frame of time. He was a Scottish philosopher, socialman in their country, not, not uh, the social democrat person, but he was very social in his own environment, understanding this cycle that he had studied, and he overlaid all of the civilizations of mankind in this cycle. And he found that every one of them fell within all of these parameters right here as they moved from one stage to the next, and that there could be no advancement or no decline without having arrived at the previous stage. Okay, so when you stop and think about the founders and what they did, and we all have lived, all of us in this room have lived in this piece right here where an, uh, the abundance of what we could have in our lives compared to what mankind has enjoyed. Uh, this is exact, but we couldn't get it without liberty, courage, and spirituality. So when you ask yourself, where were the founders in this diagram? Where was their point, and where did they then advance? Well, King George is the top, isn't it? They were in bondage. They didn't have the freedom that we certainly enjoy or what they ended up with. But the next step before you will ever find courage is a relationship with God. And without that, you will never have confidence to move yourself forward or to lead others in that process. So when those who want to knock the Constitution or knock the founding of America or its basis, they do not understand this process that is absolutely necessary for the advancement of mankind. Absolutely necessary. So when we hear stories about their spirituality, about their daily... Yes, Con. What I see in, in my life, looking from what I've seen, uh, I, I've lived through some liberty, abundance, selfishness. I can see this now. We've gone through a period of selfishness, complacency, apathy, and a large part of this country is independency. So is our next stop? Do we have to go through bondage? Or can we change it before we get there? That's the question that you're going to be able to answer for yourself, maybe not today, but in the next few years of of your life, you're going to see whether or not the American citizenry can change or to shorten any of the time frame that each one of these steps go through. In other words, I think that each of you would agree that we're in some, in some role moving, and each of you have your own idea of, you know, whether you're, we're all here, well, 47% four years ago is the figure we heard, remember, from Mitt Romney in the campaign of dependency. So we weren't all dependent on government four years ago. What has been the advance from then to now? And so you're asking yourself that question. But the course here is, if we do not change, Con, we will be in bondage because there isn't any other place to go when you continue in this cycle. That's, that's the key. So when you understand this cycle and why and what it takes to move past or to shorten each of them, in other words, how do you shorten dependency and bondage? You have to look ahead, don't you? So what are you looking ahead to? Yes. See, in other words, this is so plain. That if you want to shorten the periods of dependency and bondage, you have to get to here as quickly as you can. 
spiritually, for the people as a whole. And if you can do that, then courage to do the right things will be next. So how long we'll be in each of those stages is up to us as a people. So, but it is really important to understand that this is how they thought. Now remember, you have to think like a founder. Well, this is what they were thinking like. This Alexander Teitler was a contemporary. This was the mindset it seemed to be, at least all through the English sector of the world and those that had come to America. This was the mindset to move towards spirituality with, a, with some sort of divine nature and divine call in order to bring to pass what they really felt was the right thing to do. Well, John Adams. Now, what you're going to learn today, we're going to talk some about individual founders. And hopefully in that process, you will be able to discover or rediscover how spiritual these men and how much courage they really did have in this fight for freedom. But this is a call for all of us right here. It becomes necessary to every citizen to be in some degree a statesman. Now, uh, last week you might have talked a little about a patriot, a statesman. Well, you can have uh, politicians. We don't call them statesmen. We don't give them that accolade anymore, do we? They're politicians, and that has its own definition. That's not a statesman anymore. We have very, very few pol uh, statesmen that are in the system right now, very few, comparative to the 550 plus, you know, that we have as elected representatives. They might, they might be able to earn that a little better if we had term limits. And those are the things that, as a people, we need to look at and discuss and find. And is there a detour before you would need term limits? That's one of the other questions that each one of us have. Go ahead, uh, Mark. Term limits that eliminates the good people. We need to get out of this democracy mode, put back this 17th Amendment, and it'll take care of itself. Okay, so with an understanding and thinking like the founders, then some things that we think we might need to do to turn things around may not be necessary if we can advance to that level of spirituality and, take the, and find the courage that is necessary some things that we think might be fixes may not be necessary. So, but that's where we as a citizenry have to decide what we're going to do to maintain the freedoms that we ha were granted to us. We've done very little to earn them, you know, for ourselves. A well-instructed people alone can be permanently a free people. Well, that's what we're here today. And that's what we do as we go into the schools, trying to plant these seeds to instruct the next generation that their freedoms come because of the proper instruction that they will receive so that they will know how to make decisions about whom they elect and what differences of laws that they choose to uh, allow to be passed. The good sense of the people will always be found to be the best army. Now, you ask yourself, okay, then this, this is really neat. Common sense is how important. I mean, it's really kind of the basis of everything, isn't it? Just to think in a functional manner, what we call common sense, is so incredibly important that we can't be disjointed about common sense. We all have to recognize, accept, and use that in the process. And remember what common sense is, is a collective of the right things. I can tell you it is not a collective of the wrong, th wrong things. It is a collective of what is right. Okay? So, we come to George Washington. We love, adore, some nearly worship him. He would be uh, just thoughtful of that. But... A primary object should be the education of our youth in the science of government. How does that statement alone fit with a statement in the Old Testament? When we talk about youth. Right. Well, and, there's, and it says, train up a child in the way that they should go, and when they were old, they will not depart from it. So how important is it 
to train our youth early in their lives to their future benefit. Please, Charlene. It's incredible that when we trust it to somebody else, how lacking that fulfillment can actually be, isn't it? So for each of us. But now can you begin to see, just in a very brief moment, and we'll go there in much more detail, is there a spiritual basis to freedom? There is, absolutely. You cannot separate it. And those who want to separate it don't believe in freedom. They believe otherwise, bondage and slavery, okay? Now, you learned a little, but here we go. Everything in the world can be measured. And this is how the founders chose to measure government. Kings on the far side, when everything is one man or a very small group, making all the rules, giving out all of the enforcement, and treating the people uh, to whatever level they wanted and giving them micro pieces of, of freedom along the way. All the way down to when there is no government which is anarchy. Have we had a recent time where we have experienced this in the world, anarchy? Give me one. Zimbabwe. Okay. And we had recently in, you know, we had a... I mean, it's been, it's been years. Years. Yemen. Sierra Leone. Huh? Sierra Leone. Well, yes. Yemen. Well, we just had the, uh, remember they, what they call it in Egypt? The uh, Arab, Spring. Arab Spring. There was a period of time there where it was there, no law. That's anarchy. And so the, the founders gave us a way to measure what government should look like in terms of benefiting the people. And so on one side is Government control in every area on the other end is anarchy. Do we have a choice between those two? Well, we do, but we can't choose either of them, can we? Because none of those will give us a productive, safe life or a community to live in. So somewhere in this process between these two elements and extremes is where the proper role of government should find itself. And that's where we as a people have to make sure that we know that and we do what it takes to keep it aligned there correctly. The, uh, can I make Please, a comment Pete. That, um, <clears throat> really, the, the freedoms are not necessarily something that the government can do anything about unless the people themselves are righteous people and, uh, and, and have at their core the interest of preserving the freedoms and rights of others. So, in other words, this idea of, of government being the, the, you know, I mean, I understand that, that we have to, uh, you know, focus on what we can do to have a government that preserves freedoms. But regardless of what the government is, if the people are not motivated by the principle of protecting the rights of other people, it will make it the government won't make a difference. Well, see, and that's why, as you're going to learn, we the people, that's the beginning. That's how the founders, again, remember, now we're trying to think like they did. We the people, what did that concept really mean? Why was that at the beginning and of the preamble of the Constitution, and why was it in big letters? Why was it really meant to stand out? Please. Well, I assume it means because it's, it was the people that are supposed to be our government, not we the government. And that's what we need to understand. This government belongs to us. It is of the people. Okay. It might even be better to say we the persons, <laughs> because I, it, it's I, I, you know it's not so much the collective idea as it is the individual idea. Oh, meshing together, isn't it? Now, let's just take a look at ruler's law. 
Because if we understand what ruler's law looks like, we will be able to identify it immediately in our own midst, okay, wherever it happens to be. They go by all kinds of different names, but they're all collective in terms of ruler's law, okay? So these are just some of the things that you will find under ruler's law, and if you can spot these, then you will have an idea that that's either what you're living under partially or what others may be. This will help you define. People live under rulers' edicts, decrees, and whims. Okay? Is any of that happening here in America? Yeah. And what do, what's the basis that we uh, target with that? How do we know that? Where does the whims and all come from? Okay, but who, who, but who throws it out there? Okay, no. The, the president or executive orders, okay? See, so in other words, you can look and you can define whether or not any of these things are happening. They may be a little different word that helps us to understand that, okay? People do not have rights, okay? Did you hear, this is just an example, we had a presidential candidate this past week who said, if it is a right, it is up for regulation. Okay, so what does that mean? That you really don't have any rights if they're going to regulate it out of your control and into another bounce. Okay, so... That would give us an idea that maybe some of ruler's law has crept in under that little subtitle. Okay? How many of you understand the EPA? Well, none of us understand it, but we know that it exists. So how much of your life is directed by others, period? What you get to do, consume, the FDA, all those are elements where some other rule of ruler's law is directing your life. Okay? So, I'll ask you this question, the very bottom one. If the whole principle of freedom and government involvement is to raise the people from a level of poverty to some level of abundance, is that what's happening in America today? I mean, it's not, is it? If we have more and more people going on to food stamps and welfare and government aid, then the freedom that is meant to bring this to pass certainly is not being allowed to function. And so whenever you see these things, you can be sure that it's ruler's law more so than rule of law that is being followed. Okay. This is how it always comes to pass, by force, violence, and conquest, and or rarely, but it can happen by apathy. So how do we fit here in America today? Uh, sure, we've had a few you know, uh, riots here and there, but we haven't had any sweeping uh, violence or conquests or break off governments here in America yet, have we? But we certainly have had a lot of apathy. And that allows that unrighteous rule of kings to supplant ruler, uh, the rule of law when we become apathetic and not involved. Now, I would hope that from now and forever, um, I'll have to throw this plug. I don't have all the details, but the city of Mesa is asking for volunteers to come and assist with a Freedom's Day celebration. If any of you have a little extra time, you need to contact them and get on the committee and go get involved in some manner to help make that a successful community event. Please. Is that for the 4th or is that for the 17th? It's for the 4th, I believe. Yeah, it's up and coming really soon. So in other words, this is a way that you could grab a neighbor or your grandchildren or others, and go and find a way to get involved in something that you would never regret, ever. 
And there is need because I saw the announcement uh, in the paper just this week again. So please, here again, that presidential candidate, if you have a right, that means it can be regulated. Well, that means really that there are no unalienable rights. So as you get next week, as you get to the Declaration of Independence, you're going to learn that you have and have always had unalienable rights that are yours and that nobody has the right to usurp from you. They're yours, period. You can give them up by apathy. You can never defend them. You can lose them in that manner. But nobody has the right to take them from you. Okay? So you will learn that. So all of these are elements to help us to understand where is America in that cycle? Where are we at? What did Alexander Teitler and others see 200 plus years ago about the development of civilization and what it takes to be successful? Pete, go ahead. You know, we've talked about that um, authority taken by force, violence, and conquest, and sometimes by apathy. And it seems like that what's happening in today's world is more that we're bartering away the rights in exchange for goods. In other words, we want, we're, we're greedy. It, it, it grows out of the desire to have the fruits of someone else's production without any effort on our own. In other words, yep. greed is to get without paying for it, right? There's, there's no uh, exchange. So we're bartering away our rights so that we can have benefits of someone else's labor. You know, and in our own homes, if we have not properly taught our children, you know, that a edu good education is going to be important to them and it's going to pay them for 50 plus years. And if they don't get that, we forewarn them that life is not going to be very easy. And they may have to choose to do something that they didn't want to do. And it may be more of a handicap later to them than they ever wished. But those are going to be eventualities. Because even for somebody to hand you all this stuff, you still don't get what you want or what you need. So, ownership of property. This is absolutely essential to freedom for each of us. So, as we have these defining regulations and overtaxation, or if that happens to the people and they cannot pay their bills and pay those debts and those taxes, what happens to their property? Confiscated. It's confiscated, isn't it? In lieu of the tax that should have been paid. Then who owns it? The ruler. Whoever that is, be it the bank, the ruler, by whichever, whoever that, whoever declares that you owe that substance or that penance to, now becomes the owner of that property. And the more of that that they own, the less the people have, isn't it? So we have to be very careful about continuing to vote for and or without clearly analyzing all tax increases. Gene can tell you the city of Mesa is in a terrible predicament because of bonds and those things that have been passed and the extensions of the payback on that, which will take umpteen years to do, Mesa is not anywhere close to being free as a society. We are hugely in debt. Please. You heard the other day or the last two weeks, uh, a member of the Treasury Department went to a foreign or to a, what, Puerto Rico to help them re talk about refinancing their debt. That's a code word for bailing them out. If we bail out Puerto Rico, Illinois, New York, California, are waiting in line with gazillions of dollars of debt. You know, that vote, I think, is Monday in the Senate about whether or not Puerto Rico will be bailed out of this situation. Okay, and you're right. Precedents, and those of you that know anything about the way law is practiced now, the, other than the way it used to be, used to be based on principle. Now, it's all based on um, 
precedence. And so anytime you could get something to happen twice or even once, it strengthens your case to get it to happen again. And when that becomes a precedence, then it becomes the rule. And it becomes the rule there's never a question about if Johnny gets it, Jim gets it. It's automatic. And the amounts have nothing to do with it. And that's what we're letting happen in our society today is we have, and, and I can, I can only just say, we as the people are guilty of that process. Because sometimes we're so willing to win or to be the victor in a contest that we allow those representing us to win however they need to. That sets a precedence in our lives and in our government of law how things are be, to be decided for the rest of our generation and the next generation and beyond. Sometimes we need to understand that we could lose and lose on the right principles and it would strengthen the whole system rather than to feel that you would win on incorrect principle. So, kings, this is the power, all from the top, isn't it? From the top down. We understand that. So if it's going to be different with the people, where's the power going to come from? It's going to come from the bottom. Okay? That's where you will notice. When all your rules and all of that are a result of being told what is best for you, then that's top-down government. That's the elite deciding how you are to live because they know more about it than you do. So that's a very dangerous position to be in. So that's where we have to question those that we elect to represent us in Congress. Is it our views? Now, we hear that all the time. In fact, just in this campaign just now, uh, in fact, uh, Ralph sent me an email where there's one of the candidates who wants our input as a people, what we think ought to happen. Now, if we could do that and the voice of the people could rule again, things might begin to change. So is it just a, um, is it just an action when they ask for that? Or is it really their intention to listen to the voice of the people in deciding what they will do and what they will choose later? That's what we have to decide did and make sure. Did you read my response? To the I did. Okay. Go ahead, Charlene. A lot of those things come through the mail, and then at the end it says, please contribute such amount of money. And I don't even think they read the survey. They just want the money. Yes. We get those from the Republican Party or so on. Daily. <laughs> <laughs> so each of you are beginning to recognize in your own mind the way government needed to look according to the founder's formula and the way it is today. You can already see the holes in the rust and the contamination that is in the system. Please. I'm just going to make a comment that we don't need to ask permission to have our representatives in government listen to us. Okay? We can make our voice heard. Often, if, if, if we become the squeaky wheel and we present a good case to them, they will they will do what we want them to do just to get us off their back. To get the wheel to stop squeaking. Yeah. <laughs> and that's correct. Now you can see where a united people is going to be the only effective means by which we can make a change. Okay. That's for all of us. Okay. And the, uh, if the enough people raise a point of order with the, the various government officials, and it doesn't take very many, if uh, 100 or 150 write in and uh, protest, it will uh, influence the, that government official. Oh, it will. It will. So these are, these are all signs of rumors law. Rumors law. Yes. And when you see the military and the police being, you know, manipulated to work in behalf of the government instead of the people, that's another sign that we can see uh, where the, the order of government is ruler's law benefit, not rule of law for the people. 
case, you can begin to see that. Um, it's not a matter of where you stand on immigration, okay? It's not a matter of the level of the compassion that you have for another individual. It's really all about the rule of law. And we're going to discuss that in just a minute. Here we've been there, as we've discussed, uh, you know, this part of the process where uh, kings have all the power, all the control, own all the wealth. Well, that's ruler's law. And when you can't spend your own money the way you want, and you can't take it out of the bank whenever you want, or in the amount that you want without somebody tracking it, then what's really taking place, people? That's another infringement of government against your personal property rights. And we need to understand, and I don't think there's anybody in this room that doesn't agree to some level that we have tyranny again moving its way back into the, the, the daily operations of America. We just have to figure out how for ourselves and how we can convince others in the process because we need their help in this fight back, this pushback. That's the goal for each of us is to figure out how to do that, to convert our neighbors and friends, to let them know that you're coming, you know, to the edge of a cliff. And as you know, it won't just be you that goes over. It's going to be everybody that's going to go over that cliff when it happens. So this uh, number six here is that so many of the laws that affect us are not even passed by the legislature. They're not passed by our representatives. They are abdicated by the representatives to uh, groups of bureaucrats. And, uh, and that is basically our, our, much of our problem is, is that the rules are not made with any degree of input from the people, it's the, it's the decisions of okay. the and so regulators. When, and when you, you understand that, what part of the Constitution do you need to use as your substance to push back against federal reg regulation? Article, Article 1. Section 1. All lawmaking authority belongs to a Congress. Okay. Nowhere else is that power granted to anybody else, not to a federal agency, regulatory, re regulatory agencies, or anybody. So when you understand the Constitution, then you can quote that back to individuals. Because remember, you have to think like a founder. It has to be founded and grounded in law in order to be effective and to move coherently from one generation to the next. But when Congress won't use what the Constitution gave them, the power of the purse, to stop that uh, type of regulatory encroachment. Okay, but the power belongs to who? Well, we vote those people out. See, that's it. Yeah. See, ultimately, people, it's us. If we are upset enough about what is happening, and we're not apathetic in the process, now we can understand it, and we can know but if we're apathetic about it, nothing's going to get done, is it? As, as much as you think about it or dream about it, unless we get involved collectively together in this process, n nothing's going to change. Because the power still here in America yet belongs in the voice of the people. That's where it still belongs. So you ask yourself this question. Could ruler's law return? Yeah, we, might, day, we might ought to, day, we might yeah. insert, you know, another slide right here that might say something to the effect, has ruler's law already returned? Yeah. Okay, so that's just a good idea. When you're talking about ruler's law, these are some of those telltale signs. They've all been mentioned by you here today. All of those are unconstitutional regulatory bodies not authorized by the people, none of them authorized by an amendment to the Constitution, none of those rules and laws under regulatory law have been agreed to by the people's representatives even, nor by the people. So we really do have a system that is 
not constitutional as a whole. As much as you want or you hear from the politicians today that it is and it's a democracy, well, what I forgot to tell you, and I'm going to end there and advance to Adrian, is in Alexander Teitler's whole process, remember the, the graph now moving from bondage to spirituality to courage and all of that? Okay, what he said was this, and it's in your book, but he says that eventually in a democracy that the people vote to themselves gifts from the public treasury until the public treasury becomes broke. And when it is then broke, it is always followed by a dictatorship, which is ruler's law. That's what you have happen. And so as we look at this and we analyze what's happening, we know that we've got to figure out to get, how to get from that dependency piece and so forth on the upper left side of that graph and get back over to spirituality and get back over to courage in order to make those changes that, uh, that we need to take place you know, in America. Now, let me ask you, let me ask you this question because I've got to move forward for Adrian, Mark. In this contest, okay, if you don't love what you have enough to defend it and fight for it and potentially give your life for it, how deep is your love? All of us ask ourselves that question and we have to decide for ourselves. What is the extent and where is it that we will no longer find what? The courage to move forward in this battle, to stand for what is right in this process. Where do we bail out or drop ourselves off of the list or do we stay into it all the way to the end? Because if you're not into it to the end, how does anybody that you know, your children, your grandchildren, your friends and your neighbors, who do they rely on if they don't already feel like you feel? There is no hope. If we give up in this contest, there is no hope for those that we claim to love in the process. So Adrian, she's, go ahead, Mark. The word democracy is not in the United States Constitution. It is in <coughs> the Communist Manifesto of 1848. Okay, and it's nowhere in the Declaration of Independence either. So, that's the summary of where we have been thus far. Is that this, we have to stick with these fundamental documents and what they grant to us as a people and the power granted to the government that we elect, or else we can never turn this around. Ken, go ahead. There's a, I think an article in the paper on uh, Comey at the FBI about what he's going to do, if he's going to have the courage to stand up and as far as the law of the FBI, if he's going to do what, the, what he's going to do in a situation, you know, with, with the email and the emails and stuff, you know. So just... Well, that's the same decision that we make, isn't it? Will we have the courage to do what's right instead of what is political convenience? And hopefully we will find some of those that have been given the public trust. Hopefully we have a few patriots left out there somewhere that will be willing to put everything that they have on the line in defense of freedom. All right, thank you. <clears throat> okay, I want to go back a slide here, actually back this to this one here. Um, this is a very important cycle of government too. This is how the Founding Fathers broke that cycle of government, and that's why we have a different government. Um, there were three factors there. There were, there's the, the, you've got the Founding Fathers themselves, you've got the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through here. We broke, actually broke that cycle of government in 1787 when we got the Constitution. 
So let's look at this. The, there they go again. There's the declaration because it states the purpose of government. When Thomas Jefferson put that together, you know, he, when he spoke about unalienable rights, that they were given to us by a creator, not by government, that really stirred a lot of things up. And then that is the forerunner of the Constitution itself because it gives purpose to the government. The Constitution is written to restrain government, and then we've got these great statesmen who didn't seek power or wealth. Now, if you consider the, the, um, the Constitution today, there's over 200 nations now in the world, and 125 of them have a Constitution that were followed and kind of copied uh, from us at the time that we got ours. But there's some of them are in their seventh government. I think Italy's in her 11th government. The French, the French were in the seventh. So although they've had it for quite a long time too, we are still the youngest country and have kept the same form of government. So we've sort of been hanging in there, um, but we are barely hanging in there, as we've just discussed. So that's what Burl has just gone through, the <coughs> cycle of government. So what we're going to focus on now is <coughs> who were these men? See, the difference is, these, the, that's what I was going to explain to you, in these other countries, these other 125 countries that have a constitution similar to ours, there was a factor missing there of those three and that was the founding fathers themselves. And when um, South America went through all their revolutions from Spain and so forth for their independence, they did not have that factor in there, the founding fathers. They still had men that wanted to hang on to the power. So although they, they declared what they were, their independence, and then they wrote a document uh, of law for the people, they still had other people taking control and power. So they didn't have the full... Um, the full three th factors there that we've had in this country. Now, <clears throat> we're going to the founding fathers themselves right now, as, and as Bill had introduced a little bit about George Washington. I'm going to tell you more about him right now, and then in lesson three next week, you'll have more about Thomas Jefferson and others, that, because he, had, he wrote the Declaration of Independence along with the Continental Congress. But the Newburgh Conspiracy was a this this this, a, this to actually took place at a place called Newburgh. That's why it's called the Newburgh Conspiracy. Now, after the war, the Revolutionary War, as you know, the Continental Dollar, we were broke. This country was bankrupt. There was no value for the dollar, and um, the the all the officers, the military officers, had not been paid back. That most of them had used a lot of their own money. Congress had not paid them back for that. I mean, the, there was, the Brits hadn't gone home yet. They're sitting up in Canada on the border with their ships just waiting for us to fall apart. They're not even going to be, hold, be able to hold this together. And we're going to take advantage of that, and we're going to come back in. So we're, it was a very perilous time, even though we'd just gone through eight years of war. So um, the, these military officers got together and said, look, let's meet, let's have a meeting, and we'll do a military coup. We'll take over the country and we'll do a military coup and we'll put George Washington in as our leader. Well, they, they wrote a letter to him. And when he found out what this letter was about, he showed up at this meeting. Now, he, they didn't really invite him to come. He, he uh, came in, though, to this meeting after he'd heard about what they were going to do. And uh, we'll tell you a little bit. So the office sought power and control. This is what we use in the school when we're in the schools and we're teaching about this. And we have one of the students come up and read it, but I'll read this to you. Officers were angry with Congress for failing to honor its promise to pay them and for its failure to settle accounts. Is that for my, okay. Um, for repayment of food and clothing. They began circulating an anonymous letter condemning Congress and calling for a revolt. On March 15, 1783, General George Washington surprised the conspiracy by showing up at their meeting in Newburgh. As they conducted their meeting, suddenly a small door off the stage swung open and in strode General Washington. You have to remember, he was six foot three, a very tall man for that time, and he walked straight as narrow. So he had a very commanding appearance about him even. And he asked to speak to the assembled officers. As Washington surveyed the sea of faces before him, he no longer saw respect or deference as in times past, but suspicion, irritation, and even unconcealed anger. To such a hostile crowd, Washington was about to present the most crucial speech of his career. He gave a short but impassioned speech urging them to oppose anyone who wickedly attempts to open the floodgates of civil discord and deluge our rising empire in blood. And then he 
took out from his pocket some glasses. You know, they'd seen him in battle on horses. You don't get you know, they didn't wear their glasses, but this is what he said to them. He said, gentlemen, you'll permit me to put on my spectacles, for I have not only grown gray, but almost blind in the service of my country. Now, this simple act and statement by their venerated commander, coupled with, remem with remembrances of battles and privations shared together with him and their sense of shame at their present approach to the threshold of treason, was more effective than the most eloquent oratory. The officers stood down and the revolt was averted at perhaps the most vulnerable time in the nation's history. George Washington crushed what became known as the Newburgh Conspiracy. That was when, you know, you oftentimes will hear the stories of they wanted to make him king and he, he would not allow them to make him king. He said, no, don't do this. Pleaded with them. We haven't come this far for that to happen. And this is what we mean about these men. They did not take power when they conquered afterwards. All ruling powers, even today, Arab Spring and so forth, they take power with this military power and they've won. But he, they wanted to step down. They wanted to have this great experiment in government, as Hillsdale College would tell you. It's a, it's a great experiment in government when we have a government like this to come forth with the Constitution. So here we are again. The officers sought power and control. Now, why was George Washington honoured with the title Father of Our Country? Um, and it began even before, actually, be before he took command of the troops when he was 43 years old in 1775. But these are some of the things that we learn about George Washington when he was really young, and that we teach this in the schools as well. He was concerned with improving his character. Um, he was a surveyor. In fact, um, going back here, he wrote a book called 110 Rules of Civility that he lived by. And these were all about good manners and so forth. So he, he grew up with that kind of character and, and reading the Bible and so forth from his mother. But he was a surveyor in the wilderness of Virginia at age 15. Now that's pretty young. And he was out there in the wilderness. He observed the ways of the Indians at that time. And um, he, he knew the Indian way of life from being out there so many times and in the wilderness. So, and when he was in the Virginia militia and at age 23, he was a major actually, at, well he's, here he is at age 21. Uh, he started at age 21 and he was doing these dangerous journeys into the wilderness. By the time he was 23, he made a voyage um, to a place called Fort Duquesne. Now, this is 20 years before we declared independence. This was in the year 1755. So this is 20 years, yeah, right before we got the Declaration of Independence. And young, he was, they were still, you know, British citizens at that time, and he, but he was with the Virginia militia. And King George had sent out, I don't know if it was even King George, it was probably before him, but um, the King of England had sent out a contingent of men to put down the French, and this during the French and Indian Wars. And um, he sent some of the British regulars out. Well, General Braddock was in charge for the, for the British, and um, when he came into uh, Williamsburg, Virginia, he asked Governor Dinwiddie, he said, I, I need a man who knows the wilderness, and he recommended George Washington for that voyage, that trip, or that mission. So this is, this is kind of a very interesting story that we like to tell and should be told in the schools. It used to be told until late, um, 1932, and then it was taken out of the textbooks because they considered that it mentioned too much about God and miracles and so forth. So this story that's about to take place, I'll give you a little bit of background here. There's a soldier coming. He was one of 86 officers on horseback. And um, they had well over 1,000 men. They had 150 axemen that went with them because they had to go about 400 miles. They're going from Williamsburg, Virginia, up to what's modern-day Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania today, on the Mongahela River to take Fort Duquesne from the French and the Indians. That was their mission. Now, Washington had told um, General Braddock, he said, they won't fight like we do out in the open. You know, they go forward and bang you down, bang you down. That, no, he says they'll fight, you know, behind trees, behind rocks, and um, they'll surprise attack us. They'll do guerrilla warfare. We have to learn to fight like the number one. General you know, Braddock, he's in charge. He says, oh, no, we'll do it the British way. And, no, we, we'll be fine. We know how to do this. So they get about seven miles from Fort Duquesne, and they're ambushed. Now, if you would go back to D.C. and you're at um, Mount Vernon in the visitor center, they reenact this, this whole thing that happened. So anyway, they're there at, the, at uh, Fort, if they get anyway, ambushed. It was terrible. It was a, it was a massacre. We the, actually lost 
they lost almost a thousand men, whereas the French and the Indian they only lost a few. But they were all day long shooting at them, and George Washington's in the battle. As I said, there are 86 officers on horseback. He, now, here's the miracle. He was the only one left on horseback that day of all those officers. He had had three horse, well, he was on his third horse of the day because he'd had two horses shot out from under him. And as he could, he'd grab another man's horse that was down and got back on, and he was commanding that battle all day, all afternoon, until it was time to get out of there and retreat. But he showed great courage in that. Well, there's more to the story. There was, this is Red Hawk, and he apparently was in charge of the battle that day. And he told, I have, um, we have some other things here that we dress the, when we're in school, we dress somebody up as George Washington, and we dress another one up as Red Hawk. And anyway, Red Hawk apparently told his braves, he said, take him out yonder, take him out, and the battle will be over this day. And they all pointed their guns and fired on him at the same time. Didn't kill him. So then he said, leave him alone. He said, the great God protects him. Well, at the end of the battle that day, and I'm sorry, let me go back, that's Valley Forge. At the end of the battle that day, George Washington goes home, and he says, the day following this terrible battle, I wrote to my family and explained that after the battle was over, I took off my jacket and had found four bullet holes through it. Yet not a single bullet had touched me. This is all recorded in the Library of Congress. Several of my horses had been shot from under me, but I had not been harmed. I told them, by the miraculous care of Providence, I have been protected beyond all human expectation. There's an artist's rendition we have here, and I think, Charlene, is this yours? This is Char our very own Charlene right here. This is, this, is, uh, what she, this is some of the beautiful work that she does. And uh, there he, they're holding up the jacket, examining the bullet holes. Plus... There were bullet, there were fragments all through us here. Now, if you're back east and you go to the visitor centres and stuff, they, especially Mount Vernon, you'll see this little bulk. It's called the Bulletproof George Washington. This one was put out by Warbold. I've gone through two boxes of these because when we're working with teenagers or younger, you know, I, this is a really good book for them to have. There's a lot more detail in this book than what I'm giving you right now. So we think that's the end of the story. But... About 15 years later, so this was 1770, this Indian chief comes back through this. And well, what happened actually was George Washington and the doctor who had attended Braddock before General Braddock actually died in that battle. But anyway, they were coming west to survey the lands to see what was out west. And um, this group of Indians saw them coming and they followed them for quite a while away. And Red Hawk was older, much older now, this is 15 years later, as I said. He said, I must meet with that man before he dies. And he had something to tell him. So he actually prophesied this. And so George Washington, they agreed to meet with him. They had an interpreter. And this is what this Indian chief said to him. He said, I have traveled a long and weary path that I might see the young warrior of the great battle. I am come to pay homage to the man who is the particular favorite of heaven and who can never die in battle. Listen. The great spirit protects that man, who's pointing at Washington, and guides his destinies. He will become the chief of nations, and a people yet unborn will hail him as the founder of a mighty nation. Now, these are wonderful stories that should be, that were in the schools and should still be in the schools, and that's why we go and do this work in the schools that we can do. So, um, that was, remember the dates here, because that was 1770. And then, of course, the, the Revolutionary War actually started in 1775 before we even declared independence. But um, anyway, the war began, and I don't know if it was because of that, if he took great risks, but um, he was always riding out in front of the troops and they'd get back here. They, in fact, one time he got within 30 yards selling his troops forward. He was in the front, and um, they, they, they all fired their volleys of rounds at the same time. And this big cloud of smoke, they thought, for sure, he's gone. Nope, he was there. But I have a, a very, in fact, I was just showing this to Bill this morning in this book. This is one of my favorites here. Um, in fact, at the, in, eight, in, sorry, in 1779, this is a few years later, at the Battle of Brandywine during the American Revolution, the British Major Patrick Ferguson, a renowned rifle shot, 
and head of the British sharpshooters, quietly moved his men around in the, in the forest as professional snipers during that battle, singling out one American soldier after another, shooting them down and then moving to a new location. On one occasion, he identified an American target, and he and three of his best sharpshooters drew down on him. Just before Ferguson ordered, to fire, to, ordered them to fire, he experienced a surprising impulse and declared that the idea of shooting that particular American suddenly disgusted him. The American officer in point-blank range turned and looked directly at Ferguson, locking eyes with him over the sights of Ferguson's unerring rifle. After a few moments, the officer slowly took the officer slowly turned his horse around, deliberately showed his full back to Ferguson, and then calmly cantered away. Ferguson recounted, I could have lodged half a dozen balls in him before he was out of my reach, but it was not pleasant to fire at the back of an unoffending individual who was acquitting himself very coolly of his duty, so I let him live. Ferguson later discovered from other British officers that it had been George Washington whom he had allowed to live. Ferguson lamented, I'm sorry that I did not know at the time who it, who it was. If I had known, he would, have, I would have, he would have shot him down, but because of some seemingly illogical inclination, he let him live, affirming the Indian warrior's testimony from years earlier that Washington was never born to be killed by a bullet. Yes. How many? I bet you it's the older generation because that's who would have had that in school. Well, our teachers were the older uh -huh. generation too. And they would have they would have shared that with you too. Do you yeah. Um, no, I I need, I want to get another case then. But they're only, they're like six ninety five and go online. This is wall builders. You don't, David Barton. He's a great historian, very very good historian. Um, that's through his organisation. But National Constitutional Studies they sell them. Lots of different organisations sell them. The, it's called The Bulletproof George Washington. Lots of good information in that book about him. So that, that might be why he did take those risks. And as we know, that prophecy did come to pass. He, he became a, you know, the first president of the United States, and then he died at 62 of uh, pneumonia, but he, of course, never got hurt in battle now. This is Valley Forge, going back now to Valley Forge in 1777. This was a terrible time for the troops, and partly because they were operating under the Articles of, of Confederation, we, because we didn't have the Constitution yet. But those Articles of Confederation very loosely bound the states together, if at all. And so the states were all independent states. So with the state government, but at that time we didn't have any national government. And because of that, we, we actually almost lost the war. The troops were starving and hungry. Delaware would argue with no, you know, I'm just using this as an example, but whichever state, Delaware would argue with, uh, like New York, it's not our, our turn to feed the troops, it's your turn or it's Virginia's turn, and all of this was going on. Meantime, they're back, they're starving, they don't have enough supplies. They said you could tell where the Continental Army had been from the blood in the snow, from the tracks of their feet, their, their shoes were worn out, and it was a terrible and desperate time for them. Now, at the bottom here, you'll notice it says, the Library of Congress recorded 67 occasions that General Washington requested a day of fasting and prayer for help in the war. This is why many of us, but how many of you have this picture in your home? Yeah, there's, there's usually quite a few people who have that, but uh, this is depicting how many times he was out there praying. Um, they, they were up against the, the largest army and navy in the world. They didn't even have a cannon at first. I mean, they had their guns, but they, they had to capture that from Fort Ticonderoga. I love to read American history. It's so fascinating how they So if they weren't going to win the battle that day. They retreated. He wasn't going to waste those men's lives until another day that they could battle that was more favorable. So the greatest statesman of all time, um, president George Washington became the first United States president. He was a man of high honor, and that's why we refer to him today as um, the founder. The, I mean, the father of um, the constitution, and the father of the nation. But anyway, so how many founders do you know? What did they contribute? What do you like about them? What gets done without great leaders? And this is why we want to teach this to the children. It's very important that they know it just, just didn't happen. Like I've said to kids, well, ha you know, what makes history happen? Is it, is it just events or is it decisions that people make? 
It's decisions, isn't it? It's decisions whether they're right or whether they're wrong, whether they're righteous or whether they're poor. It's those decisions that are made, those laws that pass, and, and that's why we, um, that's what we have as far as the history. Some of these here you might be familiar with. Does anybody, you know who he is here? You're familiar with him? He's one that maybe not quite so. There's over 200 founding fathers, and we usually just talk about a handful of them, but he was, this is James Madison, and he's known as being the father of the Constitution. He was the one that got them all together, took all the notes, and, and um, it had educated himself long before that on what was happening with the Articles of Confederation, because at first, as you know, they were going to try and change those and make those better. We ended up throwing those out, and that's when we got the Constitution. But um, he was very instrumental in that. He was also one of the, co one of the ones that wrote in favour of the Constitution, the Federalist Papers. Have you read the Federalist Papers? Yeah, that's... Um, the Federalist Papers of John Jay, uh, Alexander Hamilton, and James Madison. And they, they were in favor of the Constitution, and so after we got the Constitution, it had to be ratified. So they uh, wrote under the name of Publius, so it's an anonymous name, and got these articles out there so that people would read those, and they, could have, they had to have nine out of 13 states that would, would um, ratify the Constitution. So, of course, we know who this is, George Washington. Just talked about him. You know who this is? Yes, Ben Franklin. And what did he do? I mean, he was, he was a great diplomat. He founded the $100 bill? Uh, yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> he did. He was a very was a versatile man. He was. He was. And, um, you know, we often hear uh, the scoundrel stories about him, but a lot of those are very fake. They, if you look into the life of, ben, of uh, Benjamin Franklin, he, um, he was the father of... Um, righteousness or so purity and right I think how could they come up with some of these stories and don't think that everything we see out there has been well documented part of the reason why when we did this and put this together four years ago and worked on a committee and doing this everything we have put on these uh, powerpoints everything that has been researched to put this together is either recorded in the library of congress journals and so forth this isn't just hearsay these are actual true events so um over here, you know who he is? John Adams. He was a great intellectual along with Thomas Jefferson right here. These two were truly intellectuals. And what's it, what was Thomas Jefferson's great uh, contribution that we know? Declaration. The Declaration. He wrote it. Along with um, the library, I mean the library, the Continental Congress, they had a committee, but he was chosen to do the writing because he had eloquent handwriting. In fact, it was a little conversation took place between him and John Adams. He was definitely his junior. He was a senior. And, um, he, you know, they just thought it would go to John Adams. And he said, no, Jefferson needs to write it because he's much more eloquent in speech. Well, he spoke six different languages, if you include English, and he studied in all those languages and wrote it and studied some more. So we'll read a little bit about them. There's over yeah. two... It, he had the largest library in the colonies, in fact, after the continent. Yeah, he did. And if you look at that now, oh, we have a picture of that on one of the PowerPoints for the, the, the kids at school think that's a small library, but it was a lot at the time. Yes, Jim. Uh, later, when he was the third president, he secured the Louisiana Purchase. That's right. Which is a tremendous area <laughs> from the Mississippi West. For $15 million without yes. any bloodshed. In fact, that might be in next week because I think you're doing... You're doing, um, so we won't dwell too much on Thomas Jefferson because I know he, along with the declaration that you're doing next week, he'll be in there. So the founders wanted to experiment with government by the people. So what did they do? They read history. They studied law. They studied all the ancient classics so that they could figure this out, put this together. Just a little humorous thing. Uh, President John F. Kennedy at one time was with a group of great intellectual Americans. And he announced this. He said, this is the greatest collection of intellects since Thomas Jefferson dined alone. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. Yes, and I've heard that too, and it truly was. They say they were the greatest group of intellectuals ever placed at one time upon the earth uh, for what they had to bring forward here. Yes. So here they were, they, this, we, we, and of course remember, we're taking these PowerPoints into the school, so if you see these little cartoon things, that's why the kids can relate to those type of things. 
Um, why had they come to America in the first place? You know, we know the story of the pilgrims and religious freedom and so on, but it was built on the experience of the colonists who created their own laws now for about almost 200 years before we even declared independence. Well, it was from 1607 in Williamsburg, 1625, when they came in, the pilgrims came into um, Massachusetts. They were pretty much governing themselves. Now, did they have some trouble at first? Yes, because they were still trying to hang on to those old traditions of England. Remember, they went through the witch hunts and all these crazy things, but because they were still trying to put together these forms of government, and finally they were getting it right. So they had, they had because of the Mayflower Compact and so on, they, they were ruling themselves, basically. England pretty much left them alone, even when the French came to burn the colonies and when they sent that huge fleet, and that was in the 40s. And that was another story that was in the in um, American history books that you, you can't find that anywhere now either. But um, anyway, they sent this huge fleet over to destroy the colonies. And um, in fact, their mission was to burn Boston, Philadelphia, New York, and Charleston Harbor, <coughs> burn it to the ground. That was the French, wasn't it? That was the French. Okay. Yeah, this is, long, this is 20 years before the French and uh, yeah. Indian Wars. But they thought, the hey, they're church. over there. <laughs> yep. No, that's the story of where they all met and prayed. They said, how are we going to defend ourselves? We don't even have an army. You don't have a navy. The British weren't there. And, um, yeah, they met together in the Old South Church. And they had offered that prayer, as some minister did, that took almost an hour. And at the end of that, this huge storm rips up, this huge hurricane. And there was, that two, there was over 200 ships in this fleet and um, they lost most of them all down the Atlantic coastline. Two of them survived. One happened to have the admiral and the vice admiral on. They went back to France and their mission was aboard. In fact, it was so bad for the vice president, uh, he um, committed suicide. He couldn't even go back and face the government. But things like this, America had witnessed a lot of these miracles. Um, anyway, where are we here? And they experimented with the Articles of Confederation too. Because that's what they were using before we got the Constitution now. Also, biblical study was important in American history, the source of 34% of quotes by founding fathers. Um, it, it, the Bible, is the rock on which our republic rests. That's President Andrew Jackson. Um, they even had a Bible during the Revolution because there were blockades, of course, from the British during the Revolution, and they couldn't get Bibles. So, you know, as poor as they were in trying to keep a, an army and a military and so forth, they made sure they had some Bibles that were printed. Now the Bible is a book worth more than all other books that were ever printed. Patrick Henry. The Bible is the best of all books for it is the word of God and teaches us the way to be happy in this world and the next. Continue therefore to read it and regulate your life by its precepts. That was John Jay. Remember he was one of the writers for, um, for the Constitution and the um, Federalist Papers. Okay, All of the miseries and evils which men suffer from vice, crime, ambition, injustice, slavery, and war, proceed from them despising or neglecting the precepts contained in the Bible. Noah Webster, and you know who he was. He was, he was another great orator. Um, anyway, oh yeah, I have examined all religions, and the result is that the Bible is the best book in the world, John Adams. So you, that gives you a background on the founding fathers where they were. In fact, there were 55 signers, 56 of the, of the Declaration of Independence, 55 of the Constitution. And of those 55, there were 29, so that's over 50% of them, that held seminary degrees and were involved in Bible studies. So it gives you a background on who they, well, how these men thought. So why did the founders study the Bible and quote so frequently from it? Thomas Jefferson himself said when questioned later about where did you, how did you know how to write those words in Declaration of Independence? And in all the studies that he'd done, in all of the ancient civilizations, he said that eight of the principles in the Declaration of Independence come from what he called the ancient principles of the Bible. And here it is right here. He said it was Moses in the wilderness and it was from Deuteronomy. So if you notice that, I don't know if you've ever read the story of Deuteronomy, but Jethro, the father-in-law of Moses, comes to him. Apparently they figured they had three million uh, slaves that they'd t taken out of Egypt according to the size of the military. But they, And that's what he was dealing with. No one knocking on his tent door every day trying to solve problems like the pharaoh did back in Egypt. And his father-in-law said, you, you, you can't do this. You, you know, you're going to destroy yourself and choose you out wise men and captains over tens and hundreds and so forth. So Thomas Jefferson said it was the first form of a people's republic. 
So people were organized into small groups, manageable groups, where every adult had a voice and a vote. Why did the founders study the Bible and quote so frequently from it? Because it was a form of people's law. So here we have here, and there's the captains and the system that they set up. Here's another group of people called the Anglo-Saxons. Now, they came along later on. They were in about 400 AD, and they were called the freemen, and the powers dispersed and with decisions by voting. They found that they also had a republic. Now, these people had come from the Black Sea, and this is about the time when the ten tribes were being dispersed. And they think that they, because they're the, the only, they had this tie-in with their government that Moses had. There hadn't been any other groups of people that had it. We haven't got anything to verify that, so we don't know for sure, but they're pretty certain that that's uh, where they had hung on to that heritage, and years later they were able to use that power and to be able to be free, you know, free men by uh, rule of law. So here's the, and then the Magna Carta. They were the ones, their ancestors actually were the ones that made King John sign the Magna Carta in, in uh, 1215. You know, when they said, you, we're going to put you to the sword, are you going to sign this thing? That was, he, he was with the Normans at the time, no English history, but anyway. Um, this is a very good document. Well, you know, they say we can thank the British for all of the documents that we have. This was an excellent document. It was in favor of the people having rights and privileges. So the founders gave great effort to prepare and were eager to experiment with self-government. And here they are debating. They were, you know, great statesmen. They studied great classics and Bible. There's different pictures of them, you know, writing and rewriting. They didn't have backspace. <laughs> we tell the kids they had to do everything with a pen. They're like, why is all the paper on the floor? You know, well, yeah, they had to do it over and over until they got it right. They had, like I said, great... But, this one right here, what's he doing? He's praying, because they knew this was something bigger than they could do themselves. They knew that they needed help. And so they listened and debated and listened and debated. And finally, of course, we got this now. A lot of people say it was just a bunch of old men anyway. Well, no, it wasn't, because if you look, the Constitutional Commit, most of the ages were 30 to 45. That's pretty young. And then the youngest was age 26, and the oldest was Benjamin Franklin, age 81. So there you've got your averages right in there. Then they said this was a, um, <clears throat> a young man's war and a young woman's war as well. It's a combined effort of founding fathers. The great statesmen were serious about liberty. So the delegates critical for success. Um, this is why we say think like a, founder, a founding father. Learn about them, their speeches, what George Washington did, what James Madison did. Governor Morris, he gave over 173 speeches. He's a very good orator. Now here is the miracle in Philadelphia. Constitutional Convention, May through September, three and a half months. They shut all the windows and the shutters. They wouldn't let any press or news people in because they wanted to be able to flip-flop and change their mind. You know, they all had to come together and come up with a consensus for, for the good of the nation, not just what they wanted in their state. And, of course, the states varied greatly at that time because, you know, there was slavery, and so the southern states wanted th to things totally different than the northern states. And actually, Thomas Jefferson had a really good plan, and it was one that he had written up in the Virginia legislature that a way to get rid of slavery, and he thought they would just accept that at the time when they put the Constitution through and ratified it, but they wouldn't go with it because southern states said, no, we have our state rights. We'll, we want to maintain that. And, of course, it cost... It was 600,000 lives of men that died. The, most, most, the biggest population we've ever had die in the United States during the Civil War, and that was 75 years later when we had the Civil War. Had they have done it at this time, it could have saved them, but uh, this is what happened. That was another redeeming by the shedding of blood that happened later. So they listened to each other, and they, they knew the founders fathers, when they put the Constitution together at this time, they were in very perilous conditions. They, they, they've still got the Brits up here and waiting to come back in. They knew if they messed with the southern states' rights, then they would uh, not be able to pull this together and hold it together as a nation. So they gave it 20 years to phase out slavery in the end. They did accept that one. But as you know, that didn't happen. It was like 75 years later when we, during Abraham Lincoln's time, we got the, the uh, Civil War. So what was their solution to form government to control the power to govern? 
their great success formula did change the world. How did they achieve their three goals, freedom, posterity? Is it your turn again? I'm sorry. No? Am I going over? Okay. What did the founders do with power to govern? Well, here we are, as Bill showed you. And I we actually have a visual, and I know Bill has his too, but I, I just like to use them. But um, So we actually give this to the, show this to the kids. Here is what they did. I don't know if you can see over there, but can you see it okay? Um, oftentimes they say to them, Does, can, would this stay here? I said, I could be here all day doing this, but it won't balance. This is the national or federal government right here. You can't give that much power in this little area, it just won't balance. But where the people are and the individual, we've got over 300 million Americans today. Oh, you want me to hold it up? Okay, there it is. And you can just leave that to sit up there and, and they can see that that works perfectly well right there. Um, and the balance center, I probably jumped ahead a little bit. But yeah, there it is, all power in the people and there's the power to govern right there. Um, the genius of rule by the people became the great experiment of America. People were involved in the adoption of their constitution. People directed their lives. Millions found new freedom, responsible for their own happiness, independent in providing their own needs. And here we do the ratif here's where it was ratified. That was three million people back then. Now we're at 300 million people, or about that. That's where they are. Because remember when we got the constitution, they said that we had to do a census every 10 years, and that's how we know that. So um, then we had the Federalist Papers by Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, John Jay that sold the people on it. We had to have nine ratify that. And then we have We the People is a fitting introduction to that because that's what we have, people's law. And here's the colonies right there. Um, sorry, I'm going back here. So success formula provides checks and balances over governing powers. Here's how we have it. There's the states here. And you can see, we start with the individual, and we, we tell a story to the kids. Like, if you had a bike, you wanted to um, have this bike, and you, what is going to be your responsibility with that bike? How does your family, or first of all, we start out with, you want to buy a bike. And your parents say, well, you've already got a bike. No, but I, want, I really want a new bike. So you save up your money as the individual, right? You have the most, of, because you want it, you're going to have to do most of that. But you get to the point where, you know, you just don't quite have enough money. Maybe mum and dad pitch in because it's getting close to your birthday. You know, they, they pitch in now and they'll help out. So what does the township have to do with it? Well, when you take that bike out on the street, you know, or what, so if say something gets broken on it, you may have to take it to a bike shop. That might be the city where you take it. Now, what does the county government have to do with it? You're going to have rules and regulations, right, as to how you can drive that on the road and up here, right, and these two here. What does the federal government have to do with this at this point? Anything? No, no it doesn't. So that's why, and, and that's just a very simple example that we use at school. But any time you can have local government taking care of things, um, the, the needs of the people are best met within the state or local government. You know, the, the national government to me was just the glue to hold it all together, especially for foreign invasion. And as you get into to seeing uh, learning more in the next two weeks about the Constitution, you'll see that that was what the purpose was, and nothing more. It was never, and as we said, you know, as we were saying earlier, with all of these things that are creeping in, uh, all of the federal agencies like FEMA and um, EPA and so forth, there are over 2,600 federal agencies. They're not all the big ones, like the, the subdivisions and so forth. They set and regulate their own taxes. They didn't, like I said, they don't even go through the Constitution. They just bypass that because they're under the Cabinet, which is Article 2, the Executive Branch. So they don't even go through Article 1, the Legislative Branch, which is Congress who make the laws. They just totally bypass that. Um, that's why we have all of the problems regulating that. Somebody mentioned, you mentioned the 17th Amendment. And we have that because they used to send our congressmen back. They were chosen by the, the state representatives and they were paid out of the state treasury. And the 17th Amendment changed all of that because we no longer, ha they're paid out of the federal treasury now, and that's up for popular vote. They're not chosen by the House of Representatives. And if you were getting paid by the House of Representatives and for your state, you did a darn good job for it. Now they get back there and they're kind of beholden to the federal government because they're getting their paycheck through them. And that's what happened after we got the 17th Amendment. So. Anyway, that changed a lot right there. So it's almost like we don't really have representation back there. Bill, I'm sorry I gave you five minutes. Is that okay? So <laughs> finish. <laughs>
Well, as we know, if you want to join a group, let's just say that uh, Lions Club, what do you commit to do? Sir, but what is the first thing that you commit to do as a lion? Live by and incorporate into, the, into your life their structure and their oath and their whole reason for being, isn't it? And if you're not going to do that, they don't want you to be a lion, do they? Well, this is what truth means when you want to be an American. If you want to be an American and receive the blessings that America offers, then you need to love America and what it stands for. And if you can't do that, then you really can't be an American. And that's where you know each of us are in this whole contest, is that because of what America has given us, and it was, it's been free to all of us, all we have to do is maintain what we have been given and then we can pass it on to others. But if we don't commit ourselves to the process, and if we don't love, and if we don't espouse that love to others and teach that, George Washington said that it only takes one generation to lose the whole concept to understand what that means. So where are we at? We're, we're, we're in a tough spot, people. But it... It's not time to give up. What it's time to do is to build up those reinforcements. And the greatest thing that we get to do as Constitution in the classroom is we get to go into the schools where your grandchildren and your children are educated. And we hope that we'll get into more of the public schools this next coming year. We think that we have proved ourselves in being, you know, just non-political but just exact and accurate as far as the Constitution, we hope that we'll be able to do that more in the public school system. Charlene. We need to do more than that. We need to go into, like, Lions Clubs, the Elks, uh, the VFW, and uh, Daughters of the American Revolution, all these other ones. We could really help if we could make an impact, and also the churches. All of us and all of you are going to find an area, a place of influence, and you need to then, whatever you can do to build that, and if you need help, then we want you to come to us. And we will come and reinforce whatever you're doing with your group or your family or your business, place of business, whatever it happens to be, will be a resource for you. Because that's what it's going to take. It's going to take education. Teach these principles and the results of that, and then we will be able to maintain what we have here in America before it's completely gone. Now remember, a fire is not out until when? Until the last ember burns. And we're not there yet. And we can take, and in fact, sometimes you've seen a campfire. In other words, you've, you've heard these stories where, oh, we put that fire out. We threw dirt on it. We dumped water on it. And yet we end up with a forest fire, don't we? Because of why? Somebody, something came along and the wind came and stirred those embers back to life and it caught a hold of that fresh material and burned and it consumed everything around it. We still have that hope, all of us, in this cause. We cannot give up. We cannot lose hope or think that it is too late because it's not. Now remember... Who did the founders and all of those who came to America early, and all of those are our founders, who did they rely on? God. They did. Is he gone? No, he's not. He's still there. Does he love us? He does. Will he assist us in this cause? Absolutely he will. And so that's what each one of us can do in this cause, is find out how and what we can do best. And then just slowly start getting that into motion and go do it. Appreciate you. Love you. Grateful to have you here. Next week.